This is August the 9th, 2020. You are tuned in to the virtual worship service of Maranatha Baptist Church in Abbotsford. And I want to welcome you to our time together in God's Word, in His presence consciously. And just want to say that we are so glad that you've tuned in. Um, I hear reports of people tuning in to these services from not only our immediate church family, but around this country and across this continent. And that's encouraging. And so if you are tuned in and you're not a normal, regular part of the Maranatha Baptist Church family, I want to especially welcome you and let you know that it's not an accident that you're here. Uh, we've prayed for you and we trust that it's the Lord that has brought you to this service and our great desire is that you would come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord and that you would treasure him above all other things for your joy and for his glory. And if you're a part of our Maranatha family, again, we are in process of making preparations to regather. We won't stop video recording our services, but we are making progress in preparations to have an actual physical service again. And I uh, appreciate your patience. And we want to welcome you here to our service. And uh, we trust that the Lord is continuing to lead you in these strange days. Now, we begin our service always with the word of encouragement from God's Word. This morning, I want to read from the minor prophet Jonah. Jonah chapter 2. This is Jonah's cry from within the belly of the great fish. This is what he prays to the Lord. Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the root of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Hear the testimony of Jonah, and I trust you've experienced something of what it is to be in the very depths of the sea, as it were, and yet to know that even there the Lord hears your prayer and saves his people for his glory and for our joy. I trust you know that, Lord. Would you bow with me and let's pray together now before we dig into our study in God's word this morning. Father in heaven, we all can echo to one extent or another the cry of Jonah in the belly of a fish, the bottom of the sea, far, far from hope, where there seemed no future, there seemed only death, and yet even there you heard his prayer, you heard his cry, and you rescued your wayward child. Lord, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ proves it. We trust that. Your word makes it sure in our minds and in our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray for everyone who's watching this morning, or whenever they're watching. May each viewer sense you in your reality. May they know your presence wherever they find themselves today. Those who are mourning, those who are grieving, those who are anxious, those who are sick, may they know your presence as they have never known it before. And may it be your presence that brings them to humble, childlike trust in you. 
Lord, you've made us alive in this world at this particular time in history. There seems to be hopelessness on every side in so many minds and hearts, and yet we know you are on the throne. You are the God of salvation, and we trust you. And we know that you have put us here for a purpose, to be salt and light, to point to the one hope amidst all the hopelessness. And I pray, Father, that you would use this time now in your word to clothe us with wisdom, to increase our understanding. But more than that, Father, that by your spirit, you would stir our hearts with newfound, increased affection for you and delight in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, come now. Speak through these lips of mine in the power of your spirit. May the words find fertile soil in every heart and mind which tunes in. And Lord, I pray that you would make us your faithful, effective servants in this world, delighting in you and out of the overflow of our delight in you, that we may point many to hope and to purpose and to salvation in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, we are in the Old Testament book of Judges, as we've been for a few months now. And this morning we are in Judges chapters 19 to 21. So I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles there, Judges chapter 19 to 21. That's our text for this morning. And as you're turning there, let me just remind you that this is the second of a two-part conclusion to the book of Judges. And God made very clear that this book is not just a series of haphazard stories put together, collected over the years. God made sure that this book was carefully constructed, not just to tell history, but to tell it in a very organized way as he communicates his message to you and me. As I mentioned last week, there is a two-part introduction to the book that we saw at the very beginning of our time in this book. And there's a two-part conclusion that brings the book to, the, to a close. Last week, we looked at the first of the conclusions, chapters 17 and 18 of Judges. And so that brings us to chapters 19 to 21 and the end of the story. But just before I read in this text, I need to say that one of the problems that I detect sometimes in our Western Christianity is that sometimes we get guilty of confusing some of the trappings of our Christian subculture with godliness. Sometimes we confuse politeness with godliness is what I'm trying to say. Sometimes people think there are some things that good Christians don't talk about in polite company. That's a belief that some of us have when we come to church. There's some things that one just does not mention in church. Homosexual attack, rape, spousal abuse, mutilation. I'd say all of those would be on that list because they offend our sensibilities. They, they offend our civilized sense of propriety. And I need to tell you that the passage that we're dealing with today speaks with about every kind of wickedness that I just mentioned there. And honestly, as we come to the end of the book of Judges, there was a part of me that was tempted just to stop after last week and skip these last three chapters altogether because, believe it or not, I don't take delight in shocking or offending. But think about what I would be saying if I skipped part of God's word because it was too crude. What I'd be saying is, well, there are parts of Scripture that are not useful for teaching and for training in righteousness. Contrary to what the Bible itself tells us, there are some parts that are just, they're just plain too much for us. And so not only would we be unbiblical in skipping over the uncomfortable parts, but I'd also be saying, in effect, implicitly, that in our day, well, we're just more civilized than God himself. And that's garbage. 
And can you really blame our society today for thinking that the Bible is irrelevant, has nothing to say to our present day world because it was written in a much simpler time that didn't have to deal with the horrors that we have to deal with in our modern society? I mean, we have 21st century problems. They need 21st century solutions. I wonder, is that what you think? If it is, I want to tell you, friend, that the truth is far, far different. Thank God there is no word more relevant to our situation of moral decay in North America and even inside the church than the word that God has given us from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, and every chapter in between. But how will the world outside ever know the relevance of the word of God if, if God's people avoid parts of it? Even the uncomfortable parts. The last five chapters of the book of Judges are about a society that's in decay. Where all the social institutions that should give stability and safety and protection to everyday life, they're all failing. This is the story of a nation that's really collapsing in on itself. And there's no coincidence that the chapters we're going to look at today follow immediately on the heels of chapters 17 and 18 that we looked at last week. Israel, in these last chapters of the book of Judges, really looks a whole lot like post-Christian Europe or North America, where once upon a time, people at least gave lip service to the approval of our Christian heritage, recognizing how we got to be where we are today, but not anymore. Israel's like so many Christian churches in our day that began once upon a time in the fires of revival with a passion for God and a hunger for his word. And yet over time, they allowed false teaching to slip in and false living comes in on its heels. And as a result, the power is seeping away from great swaths of the church like air leaking out of a bicycle tire. Our text today is not happy reading, friends, but if we read it carefully, I want to encourage you. If we understand what God has to say to us through it, we will see that there is still good news for us today, no matter how we've fallen, because God is always the God of his people. Let's start in chapter 19, verses 1 to 21. In those days, when there was no king in Israel... A certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. And his concubine was unfaithful to him, and she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah, and was there some four months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys, and she brought him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he came with joy to meet him. And his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay, and he remained with him three days. So they ate and drank and spent the night there. And on the fourth day, they arose early in the morning, and he prepared to go. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, Strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread, and after that you may go. So the two of them sat and ate and drank together. And the girl's father said to the man, Be pleased to spend the night, and let your heart be merry. And when the man rose up to go, his father-in-law pressed him till he spent the night there again. And on the fifth day he arose early in the morning to depart. And the girl's father said, Strengthen your heart, and wait until the day declines. So they ate, both of them. And when the man and his concubine and his servants rose up to depart, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Behold, now the day has waned toward evening. Please, spend the night. Behold, the day draws to its close. Lodge here, and let your heart be merry, and tomorrow you shall arise early in the morning for your journey, and go home. But the man would not spend the night. He rose up and departed, and arrived opposite Jebus, that is, Jerusalem. He had with him a couple of saddled donkeys, and his concubine was with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was nearly over, and the servant said to his master, Come now, let us turn aside to this city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. 
And his master said to him, We will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. And he said to his young man, Come and let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or at Ramah. So they passed on and went their way. And the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. And they turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. And he went in and sat down in the open square of the city, for no one took them into his house to spend the night. And behold, an old man was coming from his work in the field at evening. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was sojourning in Gibeah. The men of the place were Benjamites. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, Where are you going? And where do you come from? And he said to him, We are passing from Bethlehem in Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim from which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judah, and I am going to the house of the Lord, but no one has taken me into his house. We have straw and feed for our donkeys with bread and wine for me and your female servant and the young man with your servants. There is no lack of anything. And the old man said, Peace be to you. I will care for all your wants. Only do not spend the night in the square. So he brought him into his house and gave the donkeys feed. And they washed their feet and ate and drank. Now, if chapters 17 and 18 of Judges, if they're dealing with a, a failure to love God, then chapters 19 to 21 deal with a failure to love your neighbor. And that's no accident. Because what chapters 17 and 18 show us is that the true worship of the true God is failing. The people are worshiping the true God for sure, but they're worshiping him in the wrong way. You remember that from last week. And what the text is telling us today is that when your worship fails, everything fails. If you don't love God properly, you can't love your neighbor properly. It just doesn't work. There's a chain reaction with one failure after another, and it leads us to a state of hopelessness. Now, our text this morning begins with unfaithfulness. There is a concubine of a Levite, and she leaves him. Verse 2 tells us that this concubine was unfaithful to him. Now, a, a concubine in the Old Testament was not necessarily an evil thing. She was somewhere between a wife and a slave in terms of her position. God never affirms this relationship, but he allows it. Uh, a, a concubine doesn't have the same protection as a wife does under the law. She is really a wife in, in almost every sense of the word, except for the protection and the inheritance rights that she would have. Well, this concubine is unfaithful to her husband. It doesn't mean another man was involved. It just means that she leaves her husband and goes home to dad. Text tells us four months go by. The Levite realizes, as most husbands do, if they're sensible, that it's not good for a man to be alone. That's God's word. So he takes his servant, and off he travels to Bethlehem. Verse 3 tells us that he went to her to, to speak kindly to her. Did you see that? He went to grovel. That's what he really did. Dishes? I'll do the dishes. You tired of cooking every night? We'll get skip the dishes twice a week. Just please, would you come home? Well, the father-in-law is glad to see this Levite come along and entertains them for not three, but five solid days without a break and wants to keep the party going. But finally, the Levite says, no, we got to go. And he and his family set off. Notice verse 9. Now the day has waned toward evening. Please spend the night. The day draws to its close. Now don't miss the symbolism here. This father-in-law is speaking better than he knows. Daylight is fading. Darkness is rising, not just on that day, but in Israel. But the Levite says, no, we've got to go. We've got to get home. So they set out on their trip home just as the sun is dipping low on the western horizon. 
they make it six miles from Bethlehem. And it's time now for travelers, all travelers, to stop journeying for the night. And that's just when the town of Jebus comes into sight. Jebus. That's the same city David is going to conquer. This is the same place that Solomon is going to build his magnificent temple. Jebus is going to be Jerusalem. This will be God's holy city. But right now, here in the book of Judges, this city still belongs to the Canaanites, the wicked pagan Canaanites. Well, the Levite's not about to stay here. Verse 12, we will not turn aside into the city of foreigners, who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. I mean, who knows what could happen in this city that's full of degenerates. Let's press on to a city in God's country, where God's people live. Let's press on to the safety and hospitality of Israel. The travelers press on. They arrive in Gibeah to spend the night. The first hint that something is wrong comes in verse 15. And he went in and sat down in the open square of the city, for no one took them into his house to spend the night. You got to remember, in ancient Israel, there is no best Western hotel chain. There is no Airbnb app where you can arrange a place to stay on your journey ahead of time. What you do in ancient Israel when you enter a town or a place where you want to spend the night is you go to the town square and you sit and you wait. Which makes sense. That way, everyone who's passing through town, everyone circulating in the city, all the people who are coming in from their work in the fields, they can see you there in the center of town. And when they see that there's a stranger in town, then they'll invite you to spend the night with them under their roof. Hospitality like that is critical to the safety and health of society in that day. But in Gibeah, as the people are making their way home, sweat soaked from the sun and the soil after a hard day of work in the fields or after closing up their shops for the night, they see this Levite, they see his small family, they say to themselves, here's some strangers from out of town, obviously they need a place to sleep for the night, and every single person turns their heads and looks the other way, not a single soul offers to take them in. Not a soul except for one. Verse 16, And behold, an old man was coming from his work in the field at evening. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was sojourning in Gibeah. Did you catch that? The only person to offer help to this family is another foreigner, and... This is an elderly man from Ephraim. You see, society in Israel is clearly disintegrating here. Where's the hospitality among God's people? Especially the people from this town in Benjamin. Well, things get much, much worse. I think you get a foreshadowing of this when the old man says in verse 20, only don't spend the night in the square. So he hustles the travelers into his house, shuts the door to the city outside, and verse 22 tells us when the guests are with their host and they're making merry, there's a pounding on the door and shouts start coming through. Verse 22, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. Now you do understand, don't you, when the people of Gibeah say they want to know this visitor, they're not talking about conversation over coffee here. They're talking about violent rape. Let's read verses 22 to 30 of chapter 19. As they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded the house, beating on the door. And they said to the old man, the master of the house, Bring out the man who came into your house, that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went to them and said to them, No, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man has come into my house, do not do this vile thing. Behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out now, 
violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do this outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and made her go out to them. And they knew her and abused her all a night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. And her master rose up in the morning. And when he opened the doors of the house and went out to go on his way, behold, there was his concubine lying at the, thresh, at the door at the, of the house with her hand on the threshold. He said to her, Get up, let's be going. But there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey, and the man rose up and went away to his home. And when he entered his house, he took a knife, and taking hold of his concubine, he divided her limb by limb into twelve pieces and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And all who saw it said, Such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak. These are hard words. You hear echoes here? Echoes of Sodom from Genesis? Sodom, that, that people so wicked that God wiped the entire city off the face of the earth in holy disgust? You see what this text is telling us, friend, that in the days of Judges, the city of Sodom, it may have been wiped out, but the character and spirit of Sodom is alive and well. And what's worse, it's going on in Israel. Gibeah, that's the new Sodom. This is a town that belongs to the tribe of Benjamin, and this is a great evil now, I know it's controversial to say this today, but homosexual activity in the Bible is clearly and explicitly condemned. Romans chapter 1, for example, verses 25 to 27, verse 26, Because of this, God gave them over to sinful, shameful lusts. Even the women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with one another. Now, this is worse than lust alone. These men are planning gang rape. This is a twisted group of sinners, worthless men, the Bible says. And we read of what they do to the woman, and we are horrified at such evil. It has to be punished, doesn't it? But wait, the men outside the door, they're not the only twisted people in the story. Let's go through the story a little more carefully, and you'll notice that almost every player in this story is seriously messed up in sin. The host goes up to the mob to try to defend his Levite guest. He offers his own virgin daughter to them, or the concubine. Verse 24, let me bring them out now. Violate them and do what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do this outrageous thing. Literally, he says, do with this virgin daughter of mine or this concubine, do with them whatever is good in your eyes. That's what he literally says. You see the connection there to the underlying problem that runs throughout this entire book? Go ahead and choose your life path, not according to God's unchanging word, but according to what is good in your eyes. And this host is saying, that the male guest under his roof is the only person in the house that's worth protecting? This is not a man of great honor. Verse 25 says, The mob won't listen, so the man seized his concubine and made her go outside. Now stop there for a second. 
Who's the man? If you're not reading carefully, you might assume that it's the host, the homeowner, pushes the woman outside to keep the mob from his male guest, but it's not. This is the Levite. It has to be the Levite. The text tells us the man seized his concubine. The concubine is his. Can you believe that? To save his own skin, this religious professional among God's people who knows his Bible, he throws his own wife like a piece of meat to the wolves who in turn devour her. They assault, they abuse her all night long until with her last bit of strength, just as the sun begins to peak above the eastern sky and daylight breaks through the darkness of night, the concubine manages to crawl to the door where she falls with her hands on the threshold with her last bit of strength. And if that's not horrific enough, the Levite's actions really take the cake in verse 27. Now, when your loved ones are suffering, how well do you sleep? Your kids are sick during the night. They've got a fever. They're vomiting. Man, from the time our kids are babies, we put little monitors in their room so that we can hear every sniffle, every cough, every cry. And when they get older, if they're sick in bed through the night, you're not able to sleep, are you? Are you sleeping at all when you know they're not? Of course you're not. You know that the next day at work you're going to be walking like a zombie. But when your kids are ill, you feel it and nothing else matters. Well, apparently, while this Levite's own concubine is being viciously abused with the sound of her cries penetrating the house where he is safe and soundly insulated from her torment, the Levite apparently is sleeping quite well. Verse 27 And her master rose up in the morning, opened the door of his house, and went out to go on his way. And he almost steps on her. There she is, lying with her hands on the threshold, grasping in vain for the security that she should have found inside that house. And he says to her, verse 28, Come on, let's go. Are you kidding me? Come on. Let's go as if he's impatient that she's lying down when they have a journey to finish. Well, when it becomes obvious that this woman's in no condition to get up, he puts her on the donkey and he heads for home. She doesn't make it home alive, obviously, because at home, the Levite cuts her body into pieces, mutilates his concubine, and sends one part to each tribe in Israel to show the horror of what's been done in Israel. And in doing that, this religious worker adds the horror of his own behavior to what was done in Gibeah. So we have twisted citizens of a city, we have twisted family members, and the entire tribe of Benjamin shows itself to be twisted in chapter 20. The tribes all gather together to decide how we're going to deal with this great evil. They assemble 400,000 men in chapter 20, and they prepare to march up to the tribe of Benjamin where they will demand justice, and that's just what they do. Let's take a look at chapter 20. I'll just read verses 12 to 17 to give you a sense of what's going on. Chapter 20, verse 12. And the tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What evil is this that has taken place among you? Now therefore give up the men, the worthless fellows in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and purge evil from Israel. But the Benjamites would not listen to the voice of their brothers, the people of Israel. Then the people of Benjamin came together out of the cities of Gibeah to go to battle against the people of Israel. And the people of Benjamin mustered out of their cities on that day 26,000 men who drew the sword, besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who mustered 700 chosen men. Among all these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. And the men of Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All these were men of war. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse, 
the rest of the tribes of Israel come and say, hand over the guilty parties for punishment and we will purge the evil from Israel. And the tribe of Benjamin says, no, no way. We're not surrendering the men of Gibeah from justice. In fact, far from it, we are going to choose to close ranks to protect this mob guilty of such heinous evil. And we're going to start a civil war in Israel, brother against brother. And the rest of chapter 20 describes that war. Well, the rest of the tribes win but only after they've suffered heavy losses and vowed that not a single one of them is going to ever give their daughters to marry the men of Benjamin for their wives. Chapter 21 tells us that after the fighting's over, the men of Israel start to think about the consequences. What's just happened here? And what about our vow to not give any wives to Benjamin? means the tribe's going to die out. Look at chapter 21, verses 2 and 3. And the people came to Bethel and sat there till evening before God and lifted up their voices and wept bitterly. And they said, O Lord, the God of Israel, why has this happened in Israel that today there should be one tribe lacking in Israel? And the rest of the last chapter of this book tells how Israel manages to keep its vow to provide wives to replenish the tribe of Benjamin without giving any of their own as part of that prize so that Benjamin doesn't shrivel, doesn't die out, and Israel can continue as 12 tribes. First thing they do is they decide to attack a city that didn't come and help in the Civil War. So they go to Jabesh Gilead and destroy the entire population there, except for the young, eligible women. They cart off 400 young women and take them to Benjamin. But that's still not enough. They need more wives. So then the 11 tribes allow the men of Benjamin to get wives for themselves by planning an ambush. They suggest that the, that the men of Benjamin hide in vineyards and watch for a group of innocent girls to come as they celebrate a feast to the Lord in Shiloh. And when the girls in celebration, in celebration of worship, no less, when they come out, the men should rush out, kidnap the girls to be their wives and take them home. That's a capital offense, by the way, but this is the plan of Israel. And while the men of Benjamin are kidnapping the daughters of their brothers, the rest of Israel turns a blind eye to the sin that's punishable by death. And that's how the book of Judges ends, friend. Can you imagine living in a place where families are not safe? Where rather than helping strangers in need, people want to destroy them? Can you imagine the place living there where the person you trust the most will throw you outside to torturers if it will save his own skin? Can you imagine a place where people see the most horrific of outrages, gang rape, kidnapping, and they choose to turn a blind eye or go to war to protect the guilty or plan for their daughters to be kidnapped? I can think of no better description for living in that kind of a place than hell on earth. And when you stop and reflect, doesn't that sound a little bit like the 21st century world that we live in? Where the wealthy and connected fly on private planes to private islands to take advantage of vulnerable children and seemingly are always flying above the law? When we read of child trafficking, when we read, as I saw this week, of a woman trying to protect a precinct of police from being burned down, this elderly woman with a cane being abused and ridiculed by a raging mob around her, there is no more relevant word to us today, friend, than this book of Judges. So how do we get to the root of the problem? It's one thing to rend our hands in, in depth of depravity as we see it on display, but, but we've got to ask, how did life end up this way? Remember last week, 
We looked at God's description of the problem in Israel through the whole time of the Judges, that repeated refrain that dominates this two-part conclusion of Judges. We saw it in chapter 17, verse 6, chapter 18, verse 1, and it's the very same refrain that ends this entire book. Look at verse 25 of chapter 21, very last verse of the book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We pointed out last week, when everyone does as he or she sees fit in their own eyes, chaotic, self-directed worship of God breaks out. We want to worship God, but we want to do it on our own terms. It's not sustainable. And there's no king. The reason people can worship as they see fit is because there's no king. And the book of Judges is pointing out that people's need for a king. But not just any king is good enough. If you keep reading past the end of Judges into Ruth and then into 1st and 2nd Samuel, in 1st and 2nd Samuel you see that the people end up demanding a king. Not because they recognize their need for guidance and worship and spiritual leadership. No, they want a king because they want to be just like the other nations. Just like Samson wanted to be just like other men. And God responds. You know the story. He responds. He gives them a king just like the other nations. Gives them Saul, tall, handsome, strong. Guess where Saul is from? He's from the town of Gibeah in the tribe of Benjamin, and he's a disaster. See, not just any king is good enough for God's people. The people need a king of God's own choosing, a king after God's own heart, not a Saul who is from the tribe of Benjamin. God gives his people a David. David who's not from Benjamin, he's from Judah. David's so much better. He's a pursuer of God. He's a psalmist writing his worship songs to the Lord. He's a great leader, a military conqueror. David is a man after God's own heart. But even David has a fallen heart. You know the stories, Bathsheba, Uriah, David royally messes up because David, like all of us, has a human heart issue. And ultimately we see in the Old Testament that there is no human king that has what it takes to solve the problems of the people of God. Hear this, Christian? The people, we the people, need a perfect king to rule over us. A king with, with no fallen nature. A king who won't use his possessions and privilege to enrich himself, but to provide for us, to nourish us. See where I'm going with this? We need Jesus Christ. Fully human, but without a fallen nature. A king who is fully God in, in human flesh. And the good news of Christianity is that God has provided us in his perfect timing that very king. The prophet Daniel looks ahead through history, foretells King Jesus coming in the future, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. That's the king that Daniel was looking forward to. He's the king that was announced in Luke chapter 1, verse 33, when the angel Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary to tell her, you're about to play a vastly huge role in God's eternal plan and his redemptive purposes. And through her, she's going to bear a child. Not just any child. Gabriel tells her, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. We need that king. So the question I have for you today is, is Jesus your king? Now over the course of this series, we've seen some of the judges who have fallen into sin of such magnitude that they 
end up losing everything. They lose their children in Jephthah's case. They lose their strength in Samson's case. They lose their legacy in Gideon's place. They were publicly humiliated. And we all know people like that today. Maybe you're one of them. Let me ask you, where did it start? That downward slide that ended in humiliation and shame? Where does it start? It started in their lives just like it always starts. It starts when the spark that ignites the spark, the fire of, of self-destruction starts when you lose the treasuring of Christ above all things. Gotta treasure Christ or you start to slide downward. It starts at the very moment you lose that treasure. And my family always wanted a dog. I'm allergic to animals with fur and hair. I'm allergic to dogs. So for years I said to the rest of the family, and the kids in particular, sorry guys, but I'm allergic to a dog. I can't have a dog in the house. So it's either a dog or it's me. You can't have both. I remember well the day when the rest of the family chose the dog. So I humbly begged for a second chance, told them I would clean up after myself if they let me stay at home, and so they did. They treasured that dog. I remember especially looking out one morning to see one of the boys who hated getting up in the morning for any cause, especially if there was work to be done. He was up at the crack of dawn. And that boy who couldn't seem to pick up his own pants from the bedroom floor was following the dog around the backyard, picking up her nasties from the grass in a plastic bag. Now he had his shirt over his nose to avoid the smell, but he was out there picking up the junk from the end of the dog and doing it with joy because, you see, apparently there is joy in the experience of owning a dog that can only be understood by the experience of actually owning the dog. Well, I'm not exactly sure how that works. It hasn't quite filtered into my life. One thing I do know beyond the shadow of a doubt is that there is supreme joy in treasuring Christ above all things in this world. And the second that God stops being the great pleasure of your life, the second that the God who created you stops being your treasure, you begin the downward slide to Sodom, to hell on earth. And the slide may, may not lead you to join a mob and abuse a concubine to death, but it may, and in any case, it is a slide that's headed in that very direction. That's what Judges is telling us. So God is ignored in Israel. The one, the one responsible for this people having a land, the one that turned barren rock into a fountain of life-giving water in the wilderness, the one who built a highway across a river and crumbled a city wall, and the absence of God in everyday life in Israel is deafening in this book. They just don't care. The people who are called by his name, they don't desire him. And when God's not the treasured desire of your life, lesser things will always move in and take his place. So the question I got for you this morning is, is God your treasure through Jesus Christ? How carefully are you guarding your devotional life and study of God's word? When you wake up in the morning, are you, are you ready? Are you prepared? You set aside the time and you've got the hunger in your heart. I must have time with my Lord in his word and in prayer. How's your worship life? While we're separated from each other on Sundays, are you worshiping him? Is your love for Christ growing by the day? Because, friend, Paul says very clearly that Satan's chief goal for your life it's not to get you to fall into a sin or two. That's too small a goal. Satan's chief aim for you is to destroy you by blinding you from seeing Christ as he truly is. 
That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He wants to blind you from seeing glory where it truly is found. So what's the remedy? This book ends so abruptly. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The end. And you wonder, is that it? The people of God become thoroughly paganized, worse than the nations around them. The end. There's, is there no good news here? Oh, but there is, friend. There's always good news in God's word. There's reason for hope, even, even here. At the end of this book, what do you think of the Benjamites? When you look at them, don't you see a people that you fully expect to be written off completely by God? I mean, from this point in history onward, every single Benjamite boy or girl has to trace their ancestry back to these violent kidnapper ancestors. Otherwise, there would be no more boys and girls. And then along comes King Saul, another Benjamite from Gibeah, a disaster. Is there no hope for Benjamin? Have they sinned themselves right out of God's plan? Well, fast forward a thousand years or so to another descendant of this tribe. There's a young man living in the first century, and he's giving every indication by his life that he's going to carry on the ugly heritage of his tribe. He's full of pride. And when a group of mainly Israelites start proclaiming that Jesus of Nazareth is the one savior and king of the universe that he died for sins and he rose to rescue people from their just punishment. When he hears that, this Benjamite decides he's going to chase them down. He takes part in a murder, the murder of Stephen. He's on the hunt to stomp out Christians wherever he can find them. That is until Christ stepped into his life, knocked him down so he could pick him up from the ground again. And when he got to his feet again, even though he couldn't see a thing with his eyes, he saw better than ever before. He was a changed man. And you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Paul, the apostle, from the tribe of Benjamin. This man, from that tribe, With his own violent streak, God chose him. He set him apart and used him to turn the world of his day upside down. In fact, there is no human being apart from our Lord himself who has had a greater impact for the kingdom of God and the good news that has spread throughout this world than the apostle Paul. Listen to how he describes himself in Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Romans 11 In verse 1, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. See, there's the remedy for the problem, friend. Paul angry, self-righteous, violent Paul who couldn't fix himself, sweetly broken and made whole again by the Holy Spirit of grace. I could stand here and go on and on, read you scripture after scripture that would explain that truth, that there is hope in Jesus Christ no matter where you are. I can stand here and tell you by my own experience, but you won't know truthfully until you press through yourself, friend, until you take hold of the cross, until you turn from your self-directed life in repentance and surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and say to him that you will be my treasure. 
I will give my all to you and like a baby bird waiting for its parents feeding, I will open wide my mouth and wait for you to fill it. I will treasure you. You won't know the truth of that experience until you press through on your own friend. And let me say as I close that I know I'm talking to some people today who feel I've sinned myself right out of God's plan. I once said the right things. I once did the right things. But I look at my life right now and it is a disaster. There can be no hope for me. Oh, but the Bible says there is. Can God forget his own people? What can separate us from the love of Christ? The king is there for your joy. Thomas Watson, who was a great Puritan of the 17th century, put it this way. Would it not be an encouragement to a subject to hear his prince say to him, you will honor and please me very much if you will go to yonder mine of gold and dig as much gold for yourself as you can carry away. So for God to say, go to the ordinances, get as much grace as you can, dig out as much salvation as you can, and the more happiness you have, the more I shall count myself glorified. Hear that, Christian. That's what God is saying to you today. No matter where you are in your spiritual life, no matter how dry or barren or twisted you have become, God is saying to you from the end of the book of Judges, you fickle, failing Christian, you've made a royal mess. Now come. Come and dig unlimited gold from Jesus Christ's mind, because if you do that, you will glorify me. Oh, would you find joy in him? And would you cling to the cross of Jesus Christ as your treasure? There is no other hope. Let's pray. Oh, Father, again we praise you for your word, living and active piercing through to the very core of who we are, showing us ourselves with all the warts, with all the wrinkles, with all the stain of sin exactly as we are, and yet not leaving us there, but giving us hope for a future, not because of our excellence, but because of the glory of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, who came to rescue a slave people like we are. And I pray for everyone who is listening today. I pray, Father, no matter where they are in their lives, no matter how deep a pit they may have dug for themselves, they see themselves like the tribe of Benjamin. Yes, consequences for sin, but restoration, protection, and forgiveness. If only we will treasure Christ, help us to treasure you more. And I pray this in Jesus' name. This morning we've got two questions. We always end our service with a couple of questions for you to discuss with whoever you're watching with or to contemplate on your own. Two questions for you as we wrap up the book of Judges. First one is, think back over the entire book of Judges. Which character do you most identify with and why? I guess that's kind of two questions in one, but okay. Second question, 
which aspect of God's character on display in this book brings the most encouragement to you right now? To contemplate these, to worship the Lord, and may God be with you in the week ahead.